Turn with me this morning in your Bibles to Mark 1 and Acts chapter 10. Two passages, Mark chapter 1 and then Acts chapter 10. And if you can keep your place in both of those, we'll refer to them both throughout the message this morning. But I want to read the opening verse of Mark's gospel, and then I want to read a passage there from Acts chapter 10. So if you can find both of those, we will have our reading there. Mark 1 and Acts 10, and let's seek God's face in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you that we come now to the reading and preaching of your word. Thank you that we have heard the word already. It was read responsively. It was proclaimed in the reading of the law and the assurance of pardon. It is sung by the congregation and has been proclaimed to us by the choir. So thank you for the ministry of the word already and those different offerings and bless now the reading and preaching of the word, which you promise to make effective for salvation and our growth in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Reading from Mark 1, 1, the opening verse of Mark's gospel, God's word says, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And now Acts 10, look at verse 34. And let's read through verse 43. Then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen. This is God's word. Here in our preaching ministry at Roebuck, we talk a lot about the gospel. One of my earlier sermons was one entitled Gospel-Centered Christianity. And what I tried to do in that sermon is show how the good news, the gospel, the good news about Jesus connects to every aspect of our Christian life. In other words, the gospel isn't the little thing that we believe and embrace when we become Christians. It is that, but it is also a big thing. It's it's a large category that applies to every aspect of our Christian life. It's not you believe the gospel, and so after that it's it's discipleship or, or Christian finance, other topics. The gospel is a large category that really relates to everything we do as believers. The adult Sunday school class that meets in this room off the sanctuary. You've been going through Romans together. And a lot of people think that Romans was written simply to unpack the gospel. It's not like some of Paul's letters where there's a problem and he writes to the church to address a problem. It's more general, Romans is. He's probably putting the gospel before that audience so that he can gather missionary support for the trip he wants to take to Spain. And so he's telling him, here's the gospel I preach, here's the Christian life that I present. And last example, last year, you may remember, we went through Galatians, spent a lot of time in that book. And and what prompted Paul to write that book? He says at the beginning, I'm astonished that you're so quickly turning aside to a different gospel. So the gospel, we come back to over and over again, because scripture consistently emphasizes it. But what I've noticed in my own life, and I think this is true, uh, or this can be true 
uh, and other lies is if we're not careful, we spend a lot of time talking about the gospel and we don't spend a lot of time in the gospels themselves. In other words, it's almost like we, we can go to Paul because he kind of lays it all out for us. But then when we go to read the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they, they might sound strange. They, they might seem different even from what Paul is talking about. They're, they're so filled with Jesus' teachings about obedience and discipleship and virtue and giving to the poor. And, and we wonder, how does the message that we read in those books fit with what Paul lays out or what the other New Testament authors lay out? Some have even taught that this isn't quite as common these days, uh, but some have even taught that in the Gospels, that's Jesus offering a kingdom to Israel and what he teaches there doesn't apply to the church. We, we read different parts of the New Testament to understand what we're to do. That's incorrect. But sometimes that, that can get in the back of people's minds. Are, are the Gospels talking to me? If so, how do I follow them? And what I want us to do is see that there's no contradiction in the New Testament. What Matthew and Mark and, and Luke and John write is accessible just as what Paul and Peter and other writers write. And it's the same message intended to build us up in our Christian faith. And so what I want to do today is start going through the Gospel of Mark together as a church, preaching through this book on the Lord's Day morning. Many consider that it was the first gospel ever written, and so it is a good place to begin our studies. And if you think about it, Mark is the first gospel. What that means is that when he wrote that book, he was giving to the world a gift, an entirely brand new type of literature that no one had ever seen before. It doesn't read, the gospels don't read like biographies. And at the same time, they don't read like historical narratives. They don't sound quite like first and second kings. They're kind of in between those two, and yet at the same time, they're different. A, a document that is a witness document. A witness to the word and works of Jesus Christ. A document that is story and yet proclamation. It's almost sermonic in that we're, we're to read the Gospels and to hear them calling us to make a decision. And another interesting thing about the Gospels is how most of them are taken up almost a quarter or more of their material with just the final week of Jesus' life, this, this story that culminates in his death and his burial and a resurrection. All the gospel stories are funneling that direction. In fact, look one more time at the opening verse of Mark. He writes, The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. That's how he opens his story, and it gives us a clue that, that in this gospel, here is a story that Mark has crafted under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a story that's going to tell us the good news, good news about Jesus, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Son of God. And I simply this morning just want to introduce the gospel to you, give you kind of a big picture look at Mark before we start going through it. Together. I'm going to introduce it by asking two questions. First, what is the gospel? So not one of the four, but just the gospel that we talk about as Christians. What is it? And ironically, I'm going to answer that from the book of Acts. So if you kept your finger there, flip back to Acts 10. After all that talk about how important it is to read the gospels, I want to start in Acts, which isn't a gospel. But I have a reason for that. The verses that we read there in Acts 10 are a sermon by Peter. And they are a summary of the message Peter preaches. You may have noticed from reading those verses. He, he overviews the whole life of Christ. And that's a big deal because most think that Mark got the material for his gospel from Peter. And that's a big deal because Mark wasn't one of the original eyewitnesses. This is the John Mark we encounter in Acts. He's not one of the 12 that originally followed Jesus. And maybe you caught from Peter's sermon how he said, he appeared to us eyewitnesses. That's a big deal. 
that those who are going to report the gospel also be those who lived with Christ, who saw what he did. So Mark is giving us a gospel, but he is giving it to us as it has been reported to him and preached to him by the apostle Peter. So if we're going to ask ourselves, what is the gospel? Look at Peter's summary of it here. Because not only does it answer that question, but it also gives us a clue to what Mark is all about. So let me explain. Look at Acts 10 there. Keep your finger in Mark 1. I'm going to flip back and forth for just a minute. But look at Acts 10 there. Start with verse 36. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord again. All right, look one more time at Mark's first verse. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. See the similarity? Good news. Good news that is concerned with Jesus. Peter calls him Lord of all. Mark calls him Messiah, Son of God. Overlap between those titles. Look at verse 37 in Acts 10. Peter says, You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. All right, look back at Mark 1. Look at verse 4. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Peter and Mark start their story in the same place. Verse 38, Acts 10. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Look at Mark 1, verse 9. At that time... Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. There's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that Peter refers to. And if you go on to read the rest of Mark 1 and more, it talks about how Jesus goes around casting out demons. In fact, Mark talks a lot about authority over demons. Go back to Acts 10, verse 39. Peter says... We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. If you were to go home, or at least some point in the coming weeks, read through Mark's gospel, the whole thing in one sitting. You know what you would find? Chapters 1 through 8 cover Jesus' ministry in the north as he goes around in Galilee performing all these miracles and teaching, healing, etc. Come to chapter 9 through 16 of Mark, and guess what? Jesus travels south to Judah, eventually coming to Jerusalem. You notice how Peter there says, we're witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Peter just basically summarized everything that Mark is all about. Or in reverse, Mark has taken Peter's summary here and expanded it so we can see everything Jesus did in the country of the Jews and finally in Jerusalem. And look lastly, at uh, go to the second half of verse 39 in Acts 10 where Peter says they killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. Like I said a minute ago, the final quarter of Mark, chapters 12 through 16, is Jesus' final week in Jerusalem when he is captured, crucified, and rises again from the dead. So what Peter has done in this sermon to Cornelius is summarize the whole earthly ministry of Christ, everything that we come to read in Mark's gospel, indicating that Mark has followed Peter's outline. So why is that a big deal? How does that answer the question, what is the gospel? Let me just tell you three things I think stood out from that summary. Number one, it's good news. Both Peter and Mark are concerned to say this is good news that we proclaim to you. And good news, the Greek word there is where we get the very word gospel in English. And there were gospels in the first century. The Roman Empire, they had their gospel. They had good news. The reign of peace that Caesar Augustus had brought about by unifying the Roman Empire. But you know what the Christians said? God's got better news. He's got good news of how God has broken into history and through the events concerned with his son, done something that is truly good. And Peter and Mark are witnesses to those events. They want to tell us what God has done. It's good news. Second, it's good news about Jesus. 
Peter's sermon and Mark's gospel, not to, not to be trite, but they are literally all about Jesus. He's the central figure in their preaching and in Mark's story. And again, that's a big deal. Why? Because Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Caesar may want to proclaim that he is Lord, but Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Messiah. None of the revolutionaries that came before him. None who would come after. None of the other uh, supposed saviors that were on offer in that day. Jesus alone was the savior who could actually free people from true tyranny. Tyranny to sin. Tyranny to death. Tyranny to the devil. And so Mark's given us a story that, that isn't at the end of the day about politics or economics, or civics, or morals, or any of those things that might concern us. It is eventually about Jesus Christ who comes to set us free from sin and death. And so thirdly and finally, it is good news about Jesus that calls for a response. You see how Peter ends his sermon there in verse 43? Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And that's exactly what Cornelius went on to do. They received the Holy Spirit and they were baptized. But the gospel tells you something and it calls for you to make a response. So the Mark's gospel and the gospel of Jesus Christ, they address you at the point of your greatest need, your relationship to God, your sin, your eternal existence. And they call for you, they offer you Christ who has done everything that needs to be done and then calls on you to make a response. Will you believe in him? Will you follow him as a disciple? So that's what the gospel is. Good news about Jesus. Calling for a response. And let me answer then the second question. What is Mark's gospel? In other words, how does Mark develop this story? How does Mark take that that basic main idea and how does he craft his story? And I'll answer that with two smaller questions. One, who is Jesus and how should we respond to him? Because those are the two big emphases of Mark's gospel. One, who is Jesus? Well, again, according to the opening line, if you want to go back to Mark 1 now, and we'll stay there the rest of the time, Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. Now, what's that mean? That's language we use in church. What does it mean to say that Jesus is Messiah? Well, it means an anointed one. And that would ring some bells with the first century audience because when they hear anointed one they're thinking king royal ruler the one that God promised to send us back in 2 Samuel 7 back in Psalm 2 the royal ruler who will come and save Israel from her oppressors and exercise dominion over the Gentiles and let me tell you this that is exactly how Mark presents Jesus He is that coming king. Look at chapter 1 in Mark. Look at verses 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. What is Jesus announcing? The gospel. He's announcing good news. What is that good news all about? God's kingdom. God's reign that has come into the present time and people should therefore repent of their sins and believe the good news. So Jesus and Mark don't shy away from the idea that he is that promised coming king. Here's the wrinkle. He comes to be king in a way that most people weren't expecting. Turn forward in Mark's gospel to chapter 10 and look at verse 40. Because what I, what I want us to see throughout Mark's gospel is that the kingdom is here. It hasn't been offered and then withdrawn. It hasn't been postponed to the second coming. It's here. But it looks different from what we originally expected. God hasn't abandoned anything he said in the Old Testament. But he's going to show us how to rightly read it and how to rightly understand it. Look at Mark 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is why Jesus has come. And that's not plan B. Son of man, we'll go into this in a different sermon, but son of man is language that refers to a royal ruler. 
Someone who exercises dominion over the earth like Adam was supposed to do but failed to do. Jesus says, I'm going to do that. I am that son of man. But I'm not going to come by doing it by destroying my enemies, but by dying for them. And what mercy and grace is that? I'm going to come and be the king by serving the very people who tried to kill me and who will kill me. And don't let that word serve pass you by. What did we look at during the Advent month? The servant passages in Isaiah. Jesus is saying, I'm that servant. I'm that ruler. And I'm going to rule by dying for sinners. I'm going to conquer my enemies. But here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to overcome their opposition. Not all will be redeemed and rescued. He is still the king who will punish and crush his enemies. But you know what he says? I'm going to overwhelm a lot of their opposition. And I'm going to defeat many of my enemies by converting them to my side. And he's going to try to tell the disciples this three times in Mark's gospel. He'll tell them, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to die and I'll rise again. And every single time they fail to grasp his meaning. But Jesus says, I'm the Messiah. I'm the king. And yet I'm going to die for my enemies. Not only am I Messiah, but as that opening verse says, Jesus is the son of God. And what that means is he shares the nature of the Father. He is God, and yet he is distinct from God. And that would go against, again, expectations. The Greeks believed that Zeus had sons, lesser gods, and the Greek pantheon, Caesar Augustus himself, the Caesar when Jesus was born. He claimed to be a son of the gods, which meant he was godlike. But Mark's going to claim something more than that. Even better than that. Look back for a minute at Mark 1. Mark 1, look at verses 2 and 3. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord and make straight paths for him. Now those verses are from Isaiah 40. And they're applied, as we know, to John the Baptist. He's the forerunner of Jesus. But according to verse 3, who is the forerunner preparing the way for? The Lord, Yahweh, the God who revealed himself to Israel on Mount Sinai. The God who through Isaiah said, I'm going to restore my people in the last days. I'm going to forgive them after they have sinned. I'm going to send them a servant who will rescue them from their enemies. And Mark is trying to tell us that Jesus is the one who that happens through. He is God, God returning to his people to set them free from their ultimate enemy, which wasn't Rome, which wasn't Babylon. It was their sin. It was the devil and it was the tyranny that he would exercise over those who were alienated from God. But Jesus says, I'll come and I'll die and I'll break those chains in order to bring in the salvation that the prophets promised because the Messiah King is God himself in the flesh come to save his people. At the Last Supper, Jesus says, this is my blood of the covenant, the one the prophets promised, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. He will bring in this salvation and kingdom and this covenant by shedding his blood for sinners like you and me. That's who Jesus is. That's what he's come to do. And here's our last question then. How should we respond to him? And I want you to look at one more passage. Right in the middle, Mark 8. Go to Mark 8 and we'll start with verse 29. Or excuse me, 27. And again, these themes are going to come out over and over again as we go through this book, but I want you to have the big ideas in your head as we start. Mark's going to show us Jesus, the Messiah, Son of God, and all throughout the gospel. He's going to organize the material in such a way where it tugs at us. And we are called to follow Jesus. So how should we respond to him? Look at Mark 8, starting with verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? 
They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. So what's our first response to Jesus? Faith. That we should accept that he is who he claimed to be. And that we should trust in him as the Messiah, the Savior, the King. But Jesus goes on. Look at verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So Peter says you're the Messiah, but he still doesn't quite grasp what being the Messiah means. What Jesus' Messiahship is all about. And Jesus rebukes Peter because he wants us, the readers, to understand this is the kind of Messiah we're talking about. One who dies for his people, not one that brings power and prestige and recognition, but one who brings death and shame. And that's the Messiah that we're called to follow. And so lastly, look at what Jesus says in verse 34 to the crowds. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them. When he comes in his Father's glory... With the holy angels. Jesus comes with a message of grace, mercy, forgiveness, acceptance, and it is a mercy of grace, forgiveness, and mercy and acceptance that calls on us to make the response to follow him no matter what, even if that means suffering with the suffering Messiah. And so I want you to hear as, as I close today. In those verses, the challenge, the the challenge to follow Jesus as he has revealed himself, no matter the cost, because that's where you're going to find your soul's satisfaction. But I also want you to hear in those verses the promise. Jesus wouldn't be calling us to do that if he knew he couldn't supply everything we need. He wouldn't be laying heavy burdens on us and then refusing to lift a finger to help us carry them. He calls on us to turn our back on all the things of the world because he knows he's got something better. He knows that in him we will find our soul's satisfaction. He knows that in him we will find our true security. He knows that the way of the cross is good, even if it is sometimes hard. It's the way to salvation. It's the way to eternal life. Unless that seemed too daunting to us. Like, well, who then could do that? Who, who then could pay that price? You know what one of the last statements is that Mark gives us in his gospel? The Roman centurion at the cross saying, surely this man was the son of God. Because Marx began his gospel by saying this is the son of God. And he's going to nearly end his gospel by saying, look, even this Roman centurion could come to see that Jesus is the son of God. Why? Because the gospel is good news. And it's powerful good news. It will create in you the very response that is needed to follow God, and it will give you grace and satisfaction in doing so. Let's pray together and give thanks to God then for his mercy. Father in heaven, thank you for your love for us. And I pray as we finish this morning that James might come to mind where he says to be doers of the word and not hearers only, to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our soul. And I pray then that we as a congregation, that we would behold Christ with the eye of faith. Help us to see you in your word as you have revealed yourself and to embrace you as you have offered yourself and to trust you for everything we need, the forgiveness of sins, satisfaction in our life, provision of our needs, satisfaction of our souls, uh, strength in suffering or in grief, whatever you call us to do through your word. 
and grant that we will then follow you, that we will be your disciples like those original 12, and that we'll overcome all of our blind spots, or that we'll at least grow to that end, and that we'll come to understand who you are and what you're all about, and that we will not forsake you, but we will follow you from this moment on to the very end of our lives. Give us grace to trust you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.